Good day and welcome to today's little lesson on types of stationary points. This is a continuation of differentiation and wow what a continuation it is. As usual, if you're joining me from internet land, hi, how are you? This lesson was recorded for my mass group, but I tell you what, it's just as relevant to all of those of you around the world doing maths because stationary points are everywhere. And at this moment in time, I feel like a massive stationary point because I'm sitting down. But that is beside the point. If you are in my lesson, not only will I be asking you to do the work from exercise 10D, oh my goodness gracious me, I've become that maths teacher. Hold on a moment, this is VCE, it's really important, those questions have to be done. But sadly, ladies and gentlemen, there is a lot more at the bottom of this. But, let's not rush. Let's go to our little recap. Now, in the previous lesson, we looked at what stationary points were. And as, as far as I'm concerned, they were defined as points on a function where the differential at that point would give you a gradient of zero. All right, so we looked at the function shown here. So this was the function I used in a previous video. And we saw that there were three stationary points. Now, I'm actually going to go one further. Here, there are three turning points. We'll come back to that in a moment. But a stationary point is a point where if I draw a gradient or draw a tangent, my gradient, which is m, is equal to zero. Likewise, there is another one. And here is another one. All right? Now, these are also described as turning points by virtue of the fact that, as I say there, the graph at these points change direction or turn. All right? So maximums and minimums are also turning point. Where have you seen this before? Yep, if you remember with quadratics, you actually had something called turning point form or completing the square or, or all of these things gave you the value of the turning point, uh, but there were other ways. Now, there is one other point on graphs that you need to be aware of that on certain functions where the points have a gradient of zero, but they actually don't change direction or the gradient doesn't change from positive to negative, right? So that's what we'll discuss in this lesson. Here we go, stationary points, the return. Boom, 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 boom. All right, not all graphs change direction. So if you have a look at this graph here, which I've said is y equals x cubed, what do we notice? It goes up, 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 up. It begins to level off, seems to go flat, and then actually continues back up. If we were to look at the gradients on the left-hand side of that point there, we would see that they were actually all positive. And on the right-hand side as well, if we looked at all the gradients, once again, they are all positive. It is only at this point here, the origin at the point 0, 0, that we'd have a gradient of 0. Interesting. So if I've got a gradient of 0 and it's not a turning point, then what is this thing actually called? Ah! Don't rush ahead. It is called a point of inflection. P O I for short. So the great news here is that we now have all of the information we need for stationary points. We now know there are things called turning points, maximums and minimums, and these things called points of inflection. Please don't think that points of inflection always go positive, flat to positive. We can actually have functions that do negative, flat to negative as well, right? So positive gradient, zero gradient, positive gradient, negative gradient, zero and negative gradient. Right, that's basically it. That's stationary points one on one. Now, terminology, also important for this particular textbook exercise and in fact methods, because remember over here in Australia, we have the guy called Barry who sits in an office and just makes up terms to try and confuse the life out of us. And I think he's done really, really well on methods. But if we look at the idea of local maxima and local minima, I'm going to go back to the example I've given before in the last video. Now, as I say here, this point here is actually a local minimum for the interval minus 4, minus 1. So what I'm saying is if I consider the interval around this point here, that there is a local minimum. Oh, interesting. But this also could be described as a local minimum, but within the interval from 0 to 2. What do you reckon this 0, 5 is? Well, it would be a local maximum. Well, this is all very exciting. So local minimums, local maximums, maximums, minimums, generally speaking, all mean the same thing, or at least can be assumed to mean the same thing for the process of the questions you're about to do. 
There is something called a global maximum and a global minimum, and that's basically the point on a graph. Now, the graph we've got here, uh, what does it look like there? Well, actually, it could continue to do this. It's like my heartbeat at the moment. So we don't know what the absolute maximum is or the global maximum is of this graph. But if we look at just the section that we've actually been given, so between whether it be minus 5 and 4, we could suggest that this thing here is our global minimum. It is the biggest, lowest value, if that makes sense. All right, now, this is where the excitement starts. Stating the nature of a maximum or minimum. Now, in an exam, they will use state the nature. That basically is code for saying prove whether something is a maximum or a minimum. And as I say here, prove it. You can't just turn around and go, ah, you know, mate, I think it's like a maximum. You have to prove it. Now, it can be done in one of two ways, as I say here. There's the hard way and the easy way. Wow, there's a surprise. There's a hard way in math and an easy way. So we're going to look at the hard way first. Well, of course, why would I show you the easy way first? If you want that, fast forward to the 37th minute of this video. Lol, there isn't a 37th minute. Well, at least I hope not. So we look at the hard way first, and that is to test either side of the point. Now, what on earth do I mean by that? If you look at a maximum, then there is only one point where my gradient is equal to zero. A smidge, and by I mean that, a very small distance away from this point here, on this side, will be a negative gradient. And a smidge on this side, the left-hand side of that point would be a positive gradient. So if I can find out what the x value is of my turning point, then I can test a smidge to the left and a smidge to the right. And if one of those comes up with a negative gradient or one of those comes up with a positive gradient, I can decide whether it's a maximum or a minimum. All right, so that's the general theory behind this. Right. Now, this is where everyone gets really confused, right? And please, I don't understand why, all right? Because you're always, always, always finding gradients. So if we look at the function, y equals 3x cubed minus 4x plus 1, first thing we need to do is find out where the stationary points are, okay? We know that this is a cubic, and so in your head, you are looking at a maximum of two turning points. It might only have one, but it's unlikely for this one. We're going to have two turning points. Why? You always have one less turning point than the highest power. So to find where those turning points are, because we need to know what the x values are, we differentiate. That's where we got this y dashed is equal to 9x squared minus 4 from. We now use the idea that at a maximum or a minimum, or in fact a point of inflection, we know the gradient is equal to 0. Remember, this stands for my gradient. So if I actually make this equal to 0, what I'm really saying is, well, tell me where the x values are, where my graph turns. Tell me where it turns, now. So we put 4 equals 9x squared. x squared is uh, 4 on 9. So x would be equal to plus or minus 2 thirds. Now, that plus or minus is really, really important. Remember, when you square root something, you have to put a plus or minus in it because there's always going to be a 2 possible answers. Now, again, the reason we want these two answers is because, yes, ladies and gentlemen, we know that there's got to be two turning points. All right, so that's where we are now. We're at here. We're expecting those two turning points, but we don't know from the above information what the turning points are. Oh, I said where the turning points are, but what they are. So we're going to test either side. What you have to remember is that you now have two points. You've got an x value, and I'm going to draw a table with x's and m's in them, where m stands for gradient, and I put three spaces in each of my tables. Here's an x, and a line, and an m, and a 1, a 2, a 3. We've got two x values where we know the gradient is equal to 0. We have minus 2 thirds, and we have 2 thirds. We want to test either side of that x point to find the gradient. So, hopefully, you're all aware that we have to use the equation 9x squared minus 4. That's my differentiated function because I'm trying to find the gradient at each of these points. So now I want to do a smidge either side. The value you choose is totally up to you. Totally up to you. My problem is if you move too far away from the point, you could actually get a false result. 
you could actually find the gradient of a different maximum or minimum on a different part of the graph altogether. So you need to be very, very careful here. So this is minus 0 0.666. So I'm going to choose minus 0 0.6 and minus 0 0.7. That's literally a smidge either side of that graph. What am I now going to do? Well, I'm going to put each of those values into my CAS calculator. So minus 0 0.7 squared minus 4. So 9 times 0.7. Whoop, no, let's do um, minus 0.7 squared minus 4 gives me 0 0.41. Now, actually, I don't give a monkeys about that. I'm not interested in it at all. I'm actually only interested in whether it's positive or negative. And as it turns out, this is a positive. So what do you think is going to happen when I put 0 point, uh, minus 0 0.6 squared in? Well, 9 times minus 0.6 all squared minus 4 gives me minus 0 0.76. Again, not interested in the value, only interested in the fact that that is a negative. So I can now conclusively state that because I have a positive, a zero, and a negative gradient, that the point where x is equal to minus two thirds is a maximum. What about mm, two thirds? Well, same thing. I'm now going to choose 0 0.7 and 0 0.6. We know that 2 thirds is 0 0.66, so let's just choose a smudge either side. Again, we're going to say that m is equal to, in this case, 9 oops, times 0 0.6 squared minus 4, get rid of that bracket, and that gives me 9 times mm, 0.6 squared minus 4 gives me minus 0 0.76. So that is a negative value. And I'm pretty much guaranteeing that if I put 0 0.7 in, then I'm going to get 9 times 0 0.7 squared minus 4. And lo and behold, out comes positive. So in that situation, I can now say, therefore, x equals 2 thirds is a minimum which makes a lot of sense as a cubic to have one maximum and one minimum. That is called testing the side. Now, there's another way of doing it called double differentiation. Yeah, you've already learned how to differentiate. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we can actually double differentiate, and this gives us some very important information. Now, the theory behind it first, I'm going to zoom out so that I can get my graph in here and you can all see it. Now, oh, hello, Ness. What I need you to know is that here is an original graph, 3x cubed minus 4x plus 1. The red line here is the original function. The blue line is my differentiated function, and my green line is my double differentiated function. So again, if we have y equals that, y dash we already know was 9x squared minus 4, and y double dash is 18x. Awesome. Now let's just check. Try and ignore the green graph for the moment. What do we see? We notice that at the minimum of my actual curve, my differential has a y value equal to 0 and an x value that just so happens to be the x value of my turning point. Oh, shucks. Go figure. Isn't that what we were just working out? And again, the maximum of my original function, when we look at the value we get from the differentiated, when we put y equals to zero, just happens to be, or sorry, when we put the differential equal to zero, just happens to be the x coordinate. Oh, the mind to blown again, right? So this is graphically showing you how it's done. Now let's look at the double differential. Wow. Lots of stuff on this graph, but what do we notice? Well, when it is at a maximum, when my graph, my original function has a maximum, what we notice is the value of the differential. So at a maximum, we know the value of the differential is actually less than zero. Now that's really hard. And if I'd actually drawn lots of graphs, you would, have, if I could have drawn like a quartic or a quintic, you would have seen this straight away. But just take my word for it. Likewise, a minimum, we notice, actually has a y double dash value of greater than zero. 
And this point here that I'm circling now, the point zero 01, actually has a double differential of zero. Wow. Now, there is one other point that will actually have a double differential of zero because obviously we've decided that maximums are when y double dash is greater than zero, sorry, less than zero. Minimum is when it's greater than zero. So a point of inflection is actually when y double dash equals zero. But look at this point here that I've just circled and I'm now doing an arrow. Is that a point of inflection? It is not. It is actually the point where the gradient of that graph is, is, at, is at its most maximum. That's really, really important. Y double dashed is where the gradient is at its most maximum. I have seen this come up in VCAR exams over and over again. So it might be worth knowing that if you ever want to find the point of maximum or highest gradient, then what you need to do is find out where on the curve the double differential is zero. And all you need to do is double differentiate it and put it to zero and find that value. But going back to these three results here in boxes, they are actually the most important. This is the shortcut way and this is what this lesson is all about. So if you want to find out whether it's a maximum, Take your original function and differentiate it. From here, put it equal to zero and find the x values of your turning points. Then take the first differential and differentiate it again. This, put in each x value from above, put in each x value from above into the equation of the double differential and if the value is greater than zero, it's a minimum. If the value that comes out is less than zero, it's a maximum, which seems counterintuitive, but go with it. And if the value is equal to zero, it is a point of inflection. Now, the problem is, and this is the last thing for me, if you end up with a point of inflection, I'm afraid the bad news is you've got to then prove which point of inflection it is. There's no quick way of doing it. You have to prove is it that or is it this? And guess how you do that? Yes! You test either side of the point. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, those of you who have me, you are now fully able to complete all of that work. That's three exercises. Wow, much, much work. Otherwise, those of you who are watching in internet land, hopefully you've enjoyed this and understood. Ooh, if you've understood a half of it, it's, I'm actually doing really, really well. All right, thank you very much. This has been a lesson on types of stationary points. I look forward to seeing you next time. Hey guys, if you've enjoyed watching this video, why not tune in and subscribe to get updates of when I do other videos. Alternatively, click this video that's coming up now or just zip on over to mathsguru.com, M-A-F-F-S, guru.com, where you can actually access all the videos in a nice, easy to use way.